All right then, guys, I think we know what's happening next. <laughs> Would you give a nice big warm welcome to Michael Price and Joe Lister? ready in a minute. All right guys, well thank you very much for coming all this way. Um, where have you come from today, if you don't mind me asking? Um, from me by boat, so I've only just moved there, I don't even know where it is. <laughs> I don't know where it is either, actually. Uh, yeah, just, just home. <laughs> Brilliant, right. Well, um, I don't think what to ask actually. Um, we've got, we're going to have a Q&A, so we'll ask you guys a few questions and whilst we're talking, if you guys in the audience want to think of things that you would like to ask these guys and then we'll, we'll kind of open it out to a Q&A as we go through. So, uh, yeah, so how do you feel about Series 2 then? That's a very <laughs> good question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, as from writing the blogs or from watching it? Um, from both actually. So like obviously you had to write like a whole bunch of new blogs yeah. um, for series two, like so that it would like coincide. So did you get to see any of the footage before you did it or did you just have to go and write? Uh, yeah, no, I get given um, the scripts before filming starts and then um, we talk about it from quite early on. And then uh, we get sent, I usually get sent footage. So I usually get sent rough edits of the episodes and so on. Um, which is handy because things change and so there'll be blog posts approved and then like the geek interpreter he was meant to be all alone <laughs> in the original script and then they sent me the rough edit of the episode and he had three friends standing with him which <laughs> changed the blog a lot <laughs> um, uh, so yeah no as a as a fan and, and I loved it I loved series too um, I just think you know <coughs> so far six absolutely brilliant episodes yeah. Um, I think one of uh, my, least my favorite, and I think everyone's favorite um, blog, not episode, entry, is the one where they had to dress up as ninjas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you just like randomly think of these ideas like in your head? I think that was, was that, that was the geek. Was it? Wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because yeah. that's, the, it's the tricky thing, because the show, like, is obviously, set in the real world, you know, it's not a fantasy show, you know, nobody pushes it because it's, that's what Sherlock Holmes itself does, it's a very sort of, you know, sort of almost a horror movie, um, and obviously Hound of the Baskervilles pushes it a little bit more into slightly beyond the realms of the real world, but um, yeah, when I got that script that said, um, you know, a guy turns up and says, all my comic book characters are coming alive, <laughs> cut to next scene. <laughs> <laughs> I had to write a blog post that was somehow set in the real world that had comic book characters coming alive. And, um, so it was quite ridiculous anyway, so I just thought it'd be funny. And having read the rest of series two and seeing how much more Sherlock and John had fun in series two, because obviously their friendship's grown, I just thought actually it'd be really funny to have them dressed as ninjas. <laughs> um, they saw a bus in one too, didn't they? Am I making that up? Did they steal a bus? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just like that one a lot. <laughs> oh, and actually, I just want to say this is really funny, because we've interviewed both Joe and Michael on the podcast, which you should listen to if you haven't already. <laughs> um, but I just realized they haven't met each other. This is the first time they've ever met. <laughs> There's, like, there's so many different facets of the whole Sherlock team, it's pretty funny. Um, but yeah, I, I couldn't help but notice, like, when we were, I turned to Michael, when we, were, we snuck in the back to watch the last few uh, minutes of Hounds, and it's like, it sounds so epic. In this and do you think it sounds like, do you prefer it in this format, or do you prefer it on TV? Um, I think we, uh, because David and I have both got movie backgrounds, really, rather than TV backgrounds, then we, we always approach Sherlock as, as movies. Um, and so we we write them and record them like like individual movies. So we record them in the same studio that 
gladiators recorded in and all the big film scores. And we um, mix it in surround sound. So usually TV stuff you deliver as stereo and, to do, and run away very quickly. And, uh, but with this we, we record and, and mix the music in, in full surround. So, um, so yeah, I mean it's, it's kind of no compromise from our point of view. So as much as possible with the, with the budget and the um, uh, and the time scale. I mean, we, we tend to get about two or three weeks an episode to write and record and mix everything um, from a standing start, which is, is quick. It's, about, yeah, it's, it's sort of three or four times quicker than you would do a movie. Um, and we get approximately, um, well, the amount of budget we get for the music compared to a movie is, is like move the decimal point a couple of points. <laughs> so it's sort of, but within that, we you know we, we do you know it's it's great to hear it in the cinema because it is supposed to be um, uh, it, it's supposed to be music which which suits the scale of the production. Um, so you know it should it should stand up and it's great to hear that it does. Yeah, and it sounds much better than on television. Yeah, and it sounded a bit like Doors. So like <laughs> <laughs> dum, dum, dum. <laughs> yeah, no, we rip everybody. Else. <laughs> I've got a, a bit of a technical question actually, because um, I was watching, uh, especially um, a scandal in Belgravia. There's like, a lot of things where I wondered how much, like, say that you have in like the editing process, because there was a lot of moments where like the music like really went with what was happening on the screen. Like the one, the bit that I'm thinking of is like when Sherlock is coming up the stairs after he's realised that Mrs. Hudson's been attacked, yeah. and like that bit. I just thought like that. It just mixes together so well, so I don't know how much you actually have to do with that. Um, no. We we have uh, 99.999% no say at all. <laughs> <laughs> with the picture edit. Um, occasionally, if there's something, uh, it's usually about um, things that have got a very steady beat, like a kind of like a track, like a pop track or something like that. If if everything in a scene absolutely works and there's one cut, one single cut that doesn't work, just timing wise. Then every now and again we'll put our hand up and kind of go any chance of ten more frames so that, that falls in time. But uh, in TV world, there's just there isn't really the time for that. Um, and also, it's our it's our, our sort of job really to to get that stuff right. So so we get sent. Um, we well, usually we see the rough assembly, which is what Joe would get after the um, after shooting's finished. So the first very rough edit, which usually runs quite a lot too long, and um, and it's kind of you know it's all the all the right. No, it's not necessarily in the right order, so I think it's too, it's too hard. Um, and each of the scenes individually are, are quite loosely cut. Um, so at that point, we'll, we'll start to watch and, and start to map out what we think we'll do in each section, but as soon as we get a fine cut, as soon as we get a... Well, in theory, the cuts are supposed to be locked these days, which, um, which they just never are. So they tell you it's finished, and then you start writing extremely detailed chase music to it, and then they give you the version. <laughs> and another version, and another version. That's very kind of them. Um, yes, exactly. <laughs> Within the two or three weeks. So, so no, it's very much about um, you know it is David and my job to, um, uh, to to try when it works well to try and make it feel like it was always meant to be that way and it, uh, and it falls very naturally. Um, Did you a good job. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have to make lots of these changes? I mean, you already mentioned there's going to be quite a few of them. But if you write something and then, you know, suddenly some changes are made, like how often did you have to rewrite these? Um, yeah, it gets rewritten a lot because there's a lot of bosses. <laughs> so there's a lot of feedback, there's a lot of conference calls. Um, my life just seems to be conference calls. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, and then there's, there's not usually a huge amount of changes. There were some for series two, like the geek and the geek interpreter having two friends, which completely changed the, the story, because the story was all about how it was only him and how he only confided in one person on the internet who turned out to be the badly, obviously. Um, and so he's got two friends there, so you have to change that. Um, you just the first one as you want. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, and then there would be things like, because obviously, <laughs> You know, the writer writes the scripts, but then the actors bring put their input in, and then the director obviously it's very important in Sherlock because it's a, <laughs> so well directed. Um, you know, the director might change something while during filming. So there were a few things this year where it was, um, you know, 
I think I'm pretty certain it was one that was rewritten really quite close to the to it going up because we suddenly realised there was this, there was that, and this thing had changed and that so much affected this. Um, but so, sorry. <laughs> but um, the the ones that are usually more me, the ones that are usually just the fun character stuff that aren't really saying what's happening in the episode, they tend to not get edited too much because it's up to me. <laughs> I'm the boss. <laughs> Okay, based on, this is for both of you, based on Joe as you writing as the characters and Michael as, with your music background, what sort of theme songs do you think Sherlock and John have? Like, if they could have a song that defines them. <laughs> I think we should have stayed at home then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, it's like hop out from from a music from a, a, a music writing point of view, coming up with their actual tunes, right? The songs they would like um, was um, uh, happened really, really, really quickly um, from in the pilot episode, and uh, happened happened within about a week. But how long was the pilot episode ago? About four years ago? Three years ago? A long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> like and, and David and I watched the pilot episode um, uh, about 100 yards from here in a, in a screening room in Soho um, with Mark and, and Steve and Sue. And the episode, the, the, the pilot episode went through a lot of changes early on. Um, uh, as everybody tried to find the tone of it, and so David and I went and sat in a pub about 50 yards that way, <laughs> having watched it, and just, um, uh, I'm not going to tell you which way around it was, but we both thought we had a, an idea for one of the two main characters. Uh, fortunately, we had ideas for the for different ones, because if we both had an idea for Sherlock, and neither would have had an idea for Watson, it would be quite quiet. <laughs> Um, and, and those ideas came, uh, came incredibly quickly, particularly because of the very first scene where you see Watson um, alone, and you know, and, and very, and you see sort of like the inside of Watson and the war cue, which I think is the first cue in the first episode. Um, that if you'd have if you'd have asked me before having seen the show at all what a theme for Watson would sound like in a contemporary updating of Sherlock, I absolutely wouldn't have. Thought it would be anything like that, or what the music for, for Sherlock, both the sort of like both the theme tune, but also the sort of the, the shoot tune that we heard earlier. Um, so, so uh, to answer an entirely different question, like, <laughs> <laughs> that's a very eloquent evasion of the question. <laughs> <laughs> my own question to answer that, and uh, it, it's very much um, finding finding a tune for, for someone is is something that you can't really do until you see the actor. Playing the character on screen and to try and get a little bit inside their soul in a slightly spooky way. <laughs> and then once you're inside, there's some, usually something that you can take out and bring, and, and then when it works well, it's because it actually is true to them and not just sort of not something that you just stick on top. And no joke. <laughs> um. <laughs> I, the problem is, I listen to, I mostly listen to. Um, dance music and I can tell you the name of any track and I listen to it a lot when I'm writing because it's very, I listen to a lot of that in film scores because they're quite pacey and that's what I try and do with the blocks especially is keep them not too sort of, you want the character stuff and you want that in there but you know I don't think John is the type of person to use like me, this is the type of person to use very long sentences or very long words, when, when short words and short sentences I do. So I don't know I see it, actually, there was what, uh, do you know Muse? Is it Map of the Problem of Tea? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That sort of feels very Sherlocky to me. So there's the song. Thank you, Joe. I have another musical related question. <laughs> what, how, how important is the instruments that you use for like the feel of something? Thanks, Joe. <laughs> The, uh, a, a, a lot of the um, it, it is very important to get the 
what we think to be the right instruments for stuff because um, not just the uh, not just the notes you're playing, but the, the sound of the instruments and the um, and the character that they that they give contribute a, a great deal to um, to the overall sound of things. We we sort of um, moved things on a bit in in season two because we felt that season two episodes were more specific. Each episode had slightly more of its own character, or it felt like it was slightly uh, more defined this time round. So, so David and I did um, deliberately. So, Hound, which you which have just heard, was sort of deliberately ele electronic for the most of it, um, and that sort of came out of the you know the, the nature of the of the crazy drug in the in the fog and, and the transformative sense of it and the, and the way that it was hallucinatory. Um, <laughs> Sherlock's playing the violin in the first episode, and and it was the grand romance that isn't a romance sort of thing for the for episode one. So it felt good to to really go so to you know to to feature the violin in the first episode, and in the last one it was um, which you just about to see, which is very exciting. Um, the uh, I, I think in a in a way it was sort of a, uh, a a turn back to a kind of classic film vocabulary where it is. Um, it's heavily string, string based, but also that's for for me. I have to say that's a very personal vocabulary. That's how I sort of um, how I feel very comfortable expressing myself musically is with a with an orchestra. And so when we get get to the end of Reichenbach, um, then it, it, it's both sort of personal to the characters, uh, but also personal to Dave and I in a way that that's kind of how we. That is how we choose to express ourselves as well. Um, that's an answer to a different question. <laughs> that's fine. I'm being busy, I've only got one more question, really. Unless anybody else has got a question on the stage, we'll probably open it out. But um, I, don't, I don't know if you can answer this question. This is for Joe specifically. I don't know if you're allowed to answer this question, um, but I'm intrigued to know, like, if you could write. Um, the first episode of the next series, like, would you have a way for Sherlock to have gotten out of like killing himself? How would, would you write that? How would you write that? I genuinely, have, uh, if you're leading me to see if I know, no, I would, I would do that. I genuinely have no idea. I've not heard anything about series three. Okay, that's why. Um, and luckily, you know, it's John's block, not Sherlock's block, so I don't have to try and explain it. Um, my only theory is it's something to do with Molly because he goes and sees Molly in the hospital where he then falls off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while since I've seen it. Um, he jumps and then falls, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm guessing that Molly, Molly's involved somehow, yeah. And that means more Molly in, series, in that first That's what I want to say. Well, um, yeah, should we open it out? Right, guys. <laughs> <laughs> do you have questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, my question's for Joe. If you could write any blog story you wanted from the canon, what would you... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if you could write any blog story from the canon, what would you choose to transform? Is there one you particularly enjoy? Haven't managed to do yet? Or? Uh, there was one, because I originally pitched to write for the series when it was going to be a longer series. And we discussed an idea, and what I was uh, playing around with was... I can't remember the name of the story. Is it The Monkey's Paw? Is that the title of a story? Um, no, sure it's, it's, there's, it's a really bad short story. It's, it's not a good one. The it's called The Creeping Man. The Creeping... The Creeping Man. With the Creeping Man. The Creeping Man. And, um, yeah, it was... Uh, it was um, it's about, basically, a man who's... You know, they think there's a gorilla or something. <laughs> because he's gone abroad to take Viagra to get a <laughs> for his young wife. And it's quite obvious. It's one of those things that probably wasn't too obvious at the time. Unfortunately, because of Viagra and stuff now, you kind of get it very quickly when it's just the <laughs> um, And it's quite bomb because he basically is turning into a gorilla because he's taking <laughs> gorilla juice or something. Um, and I had an idea, which actually you couldn't do because it's quite similar to what Martin did with Hound, was. Um, of a doctor um, who was testing out uh, makeup, and so it wasn't uh, a sexual thing, it was about looking young, and it had uh, chemicals in it that were driving people mad, 
and I, it was all second one the tower block, and I used some of that in one of the blog posts, the speckled blonde one. I can never remember what the real title is. <laughs> um, so yeah, it would be that. I like the, you know, because I like the madness. I like the, the slightly heightened sort of the madness of Moriarty and the madness of the, the baddies and the slightly horror movie stuff. So yeah, it would be the the creeping man. Awesome. <laughs> Good question. Thank you. <laughs> Um, the, the question was about the tracks that are in the in the program that we that Dave and I don't write. So Cinnamon and the uh, theme Magpie and Staying Alive. Staying Alive. <laughs> 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 really, really good. Uh, the answer is the majority of those are scripted, um, and there is an interesting uh, slightly geek fact. Interesting battle usually with British Made TV and the BBC's blanket license for what they can use for when the programs go overseas. So um, BBC in this country can use pretty much any music they want in their shows without paying anything extra for it. So you'll, you'll find the British, if you watch Top Gear for instance, I hope you don't, but if you do. Um, you better do. Top, Top Gear in this country uses pretty much every record you've ever heard, every huge record, every huge soundtrack. But when it's licensed for overseas, then they have to strip all the music off and we put different music on. So there was a big conversation about cinema actually that we had. Um, because Toby and Elaine, the uh, director and producer of that one, when, when Dave and I sat through and watched it, we, we watched the scene through with Cinema in, which was already been scripted and put in. And we um, pretty much liked it first time. So like, it kind of, it, it, it grew on us to a certain extent. Um, but then it grew on us more when um, Elaine said, yeah, we might not be able to clear it for the rest of the world, so you might have to write something better. <laughs> like, what? No <laughs> pressure. Do you know what? I really like it now. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody should have that one. And so no, so they're mostly put in, and, and the Thieving Magpie, the Rossini piece, um, that Moriarty breaks the crown jewels case to, uh, that was scripted and played on set, actually. So, uh, and so Andrew was kind of like, um, monkeying about to, to it <laughs> on set. Um, it, it's usually more of a sort of... Um, uh, Sherlock's a very uh, well-produced show in the sense of that the, the producers uh, and directors are uh, in, you know, incredibly at the top of their game, so a lot of the stuff that usually we struggle with, which is people changing tracks in films at the very last minute, just as you'd written a transition into the track and a transition out of the track in the right key. And then they will kind of go, oh yeah, no, we've changed it. Brilliant. Um, but so we, we, we try not to do uh, that sort of stuff on show. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I can see it. Um, yeah, 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 there. I guess we're in your way. Yes, please, we can. You uh -huh. the microphone. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have two questions for Joe. Um, how much for your, uh, of your writing is left in the films? Um, and the second one for Michael. Um, how do you share with David um, the writing? What, who, who does which part in writing music? So you yeah. repeat mine? Sorry? Sorry, you repeat mine. How much of my writing is left in? How how much of your blog writing? What you write for the blog or the show, how much is left? What you write, how much is left in the show or seen in the show? It's seen in the show. Yeah, I mean, what I wrote was yeah. seen in the show yeah. in Series 2 because yeah. the blog was obviously important in the um, the first story of Series 2. It's just called... <laughs> what? Yeah. Scandal. Scandal. <laughs> Yeah, and so the blog is seen on screen quite a bit in uh, Scandal in Belgravia. Um, uh, so yeah, I wrote that, that that then appears on the screen. Um, but for the most part, you know, you, you, tend, you tend not to see a lot of it on the screen because they're too busy solving crimes and having <laughs> adventures. Thanks, Jeff. Um, uh, how do David and I split up the work? Uh, it depends on um, on our diaries and what other things we're pretending that we're not doing at the same time. <laughs> and we um, 
but now it's sort of now we've got some established themes and things. Then uh, we he worked. I work from um, a couple of studios in Hertfordshire where I live, and then and David works in Air Studios where we do the recording in Hampstead. So most of most of the collaboration is it's all exchanging files and exchanging MP3s and and uh, singing singing at each other. Uh, he could actually sing really well. I'm all <laughs> singing really well. But um, it's it's <laughs> that, that definitely wasn't a hint. Um, but I, I think it's uh, I mean we Dave and I have worked together for about ten years now since um, we did a uh, I ages and ages ago was assistant to another composer a guy called Michael Kamen who did uh, Robin Hood Prince of Thieves and Die Hard and Lethal Weapon and all those kind of things and he and so that's I spent five years with him um, learning the ropes here and here in the States and so um, coming out of that I, I met David and we worked um, I, I helped him out on a, on a film that he was um, he had some scheduling issues with and and really in that 10 years we've, we've written in all kinds of different ways together we've both got our different strengths uh, and things that come naturally to us but having somebody else who's, who's now a very great friend after, after 10 years um, to bounce ideas off is, is in, incredibly valid so even if um, a particular cue from a particular show emerged from one of our studios rather than the other then nothing really goes into Sherlock without both of us liking it without mean, both of us thinking it's right and then of course so we, we get to the point where we like it and then, um, and then we send it off to everybody else to get it rejected <laughs> <laughs> and they all decide whether they like it um, Paul lovely Paul McGuigan smashing chap um, very um, yeah I mean that he basically treats the whole of Sherlock like them like their movies when there's a hundred million dollars and months and months and months to spend. So, so he literally will sort of like put things under a, an absolute microscope in the same way that we, that we I mean, it's okay because we're used to it, but we're kind of used to it and then used to having the resources and the time, the time to do it. So, so sometimes it is kind of, um, yeah. <laughs> Can I just start in quickly? Um, is that quite normal then for you to work like in partnerships and that kind of, um, not on the music? I, I, I think David and I are a bit, uh, a bit weird that way, really, and um, we've sort of... Um, you haven't killed each other yet, then? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's strange. It, it really is very much like having um, having somebody else to take the heat when it's getting messy, or just sort of um, a, a, another another set of ears in, in your room, really. Um, I don't write with anybody else um, these days. I used to sort of do a bit of kind of like done for higher stuff but I, I just write with David now um, and, and across on my own and um, yeah it's sort of it's, it's bizarre sometimes you look at a couple in a, in a marriage and you go I've got no idea how that works <laughs> it's really just a block they sh shouldn't get on um, but over 10 years Dave and I are now firm friends and sort of um, um, musically too which is, is great really you're gonna you're gonna hate me for asking this but um if you were Holmes and Watson, which would be Sorry guys, I'm just going to question. Oh yeah. Let's see what's going on. Yeah, this 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 won't go anywhere, will it? No. Certainly nobody sweeting as we speak. What happens if Nestor Square stays in Nestor Square? Do you know what I I think I think the 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 weird thing is that we're probably, we both think we're Sherlock. <laughs> and I think actually we're probably both Watson. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds legit. <laughs> Great, thanks. I have the microphone, so sadly I'm going to ask the question. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's a voice from above. <laughs> Stand up! Stand up so we can see you! Oh! Oh! Hey, PJ! Yeah. Um, listen, uh, was there any practical movies or books that inspired both the writing style of the blog and the music? Any, sorry, films or... I missed the beginning. Films or books? <laughs> What's in Films or books? Um, but to be honest, it was all there in the... In the um, 
in the scripts. Um, and then it made a big difference and I got to see how they were playing it, how the actors did it. Um, I'm trying to think, I can't, when, what, when I first started on it, the one thing Stephen and Mark said to do was to watch the um, uh, Basil Rathbone films. <coughs> Um, because he said, I've, I've never seen, I've never seen them or the ITV show, um, and so they said, don't watch the ITV show. It's, they said it's brilliant, but it's it's not the style that, that we'll be going for. We're going for adventures rather than sort of very dark, serious, um, sort of very sedate um, episodes. And so I did. I watched all the the Battle Rathbone films, which are amazing. I love them. Um, and so I think I tried. That influenced the humour that I tried to put in the blog. So I sort of tried to go. It is that thing of if you ask someone who's never read Sherlock Holmes, you know, who's only ever seen the old spoof bit or something, you know, they do sort of think that Watson is incredibly stupid and that Sherlock is absolutely humourless. And they're not. You know, they are best friends, and that's what I tried to develop in in the blog. Their journey from not knowing each other. Um, to actually having a lot of respect and a lot of and having fun, you know, it's I think that's the, the big thing they do have is they, you know, they give each other the life that they need. They, you know, they, they both fulfil a very important part in the other person's life, um, and therefore they get to have a lot of fun. So yeah, I think if anything, it was the the Battle Rathbone films, which while they do have a very stupid what's in it, um, they also have a lot of humour and a lot of you do you know a lot of fun. Between the two characters, so. <laughs> so, um, I I think it's, it is a favourite um, internet thing is to to try and draw similarities between um, between different film scores, and um, it sort of um, doesn't work like that in our heads. In terms of if you write if you write a lot of movie music for a living, you're just <laughs> swimming in a sea of movie music all the time, of all the music that's out there. I, Dave and I are both judges for BAFTAs and all those kind of things. And, uh, and it means that you, you, at certain times of the year, watch a load of films back to back, and you sort of, and, and obviously we're sort of often asked about other, other kinds of music from other kinds of films. So, so you sort of, um, you, you end up with a, with a huge kind of like a soup in your head of, of music, just like, yeah. Like a thick vegetable soup, <laughs> and so and so really kind of in, in terms of inspiration, you really try and sort of actively avoid um, having a particular specific thing in in mind. Um, it's it's much more than about sort of seeing what's on screen and trying to and trying to reach into into your musical soup. And fetch out the right thing that you think works for the for the program that you've got, um, because then there are only sort of twelve notes depending on how you arrange them, um, and, and a sort of certain uh, limited range of instruments. Then it sometimes comes out, and, and you think, brilliant, totally nailed it. That's amazing. Well done, me. And then somebody goes, in fact, I did I did the music for Horrid Henry the movie in three D last year. It's been a real triumph. <laughs> and, um, and I absolutely thought I'd nailed it. I was I, um, sat at a friend's house and I, I got the main theme, it was brilliant. And um, I hummed it into my iPhone, as I um, want to do these days. And, um, and then and, and I, I played it to the director, who's a, who's a lovely friend, and the editor. And they just went really quiet. And we know each other, so I wasn't quite sure why. why. It's great, it's brilliant. It's really brilliant. And then, it turns out that it was absolutely note for note the same as Hong Kong Fui. <laughs> I had seen when I was a kid, it's probably a bit over the head of something that I could go audience, but go, go and check out Hong Kong Fui. <laughs> Genius cartoon, really great theme tune. And somehow that had emerged through my subconscious. So it's sort of, um, yeah, it's, it, it's difficult. We, we try and stay really, really unself-conscious about stuff um, and just do what feels right because as soon as you start sort of picking your own influences apart even after the event I mean it's kind of like it's really really nice when people say they like music um, that you've written something that it's a very natural next step 
for people because if they associate it with something they like, they kind of go, I love the music for that film, it sounds just like this other film. <laughs> and you kind of, and, and, and that's a really, you know, they mean it in a really nice way because that's another film that they've enjoyed. But there's a little bit of the, the sort of massively self-critical um, therapy necessary <laughs> creative people's heads. And it kind of goes, <laughs> and you go home and YouTube and go, <laughs> So, so we're just we're trying to be trying to be honest and trying to and trying to really do what's what's right for the show. Um, there's loads of music that Dave and I absolutely love, and actually most of the most of our influences are '60s stuff, really, like the Swainers and those kind of things that are, are really great theme tunes um, from the kind of '60s and '70s when you were allowed to do tunes. So we've been trying to bring tunes back into fashion. <laughs> Next question. Um, wait, wait for the microphone. <laughs> um, well, I've got a question each. Um, one for um, Joe. Um, uh, we love the little um, hat tips in the blogs to some of the characters and figures and the whole history of home. So there's a type detective Sydney Paget, I think, in the al in the aluminium crutch, and we've got Toby the cat as well. Are they um, intentional or do they actually come quite easy when you're writing it? And I've got a music question as well. <laughs> and just the music question is: um, Does Holmes' long-standing canonical association with the violin influence your instrument choices at all? Okay. Uh, I yes, it's mostly intentional. Um, although I couldn't tell you where Toby the cat came from. It's a dog, apparently. Someone yeah, yeah asked that in that um, the long interview thing I did. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, um, just because it's what they do in the show and it amuses me and I've got some good names and um, I can always tell whether somebody in a blog post is named after somebody from Sherlock Holmes, which basically I just use Wikipedia a lot. Um, I don't, I, I, I've read all the stories, I do love all the stories, but you know, I couldn't tell you the names of detectives in each one or whatever, so there's a very nice handy Wikipedia page that lists all the Sherlock Holmes detectives and so on. Um, but yes, if it's a blog post that I recognise names in because they're my friends, um, then I know they're my friends and pretty much every other character is named after someone or something to do with, with the, the history of um, the books and the, or the films and so on. Um, violin, yes. Yes, violin. Um, the violin playing, the sync in the violin playing in, in Susan 2 isn't very good. I didn't, I didn't. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. We tried really hard and then they changed the cut after we'd done the violin. It'll be better in season three, I promise. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, yes, uh, we tried to go through the sort of um, the obvious of having. I mean, I think that again, I actually didn't. I didn't deliberately didn't watch the Robert Downey Jr. films or the Basil Rathbone ones. or pretty much tried not to watch anything else, just to avoid the Hong Kong fooey uh, <laughs> situation. But the. Um, so we, we talked about having the main Sherlock theme being being quite violin-y because obviously you know that, that is very much part of his heritage but it's sort of um, we ended up um, really just bringing it through in Scandal in a way that felt natural at that time because you see him playing on screen and there are some nods that Stephen um, put into there's the orig original Basil Rathbone show where I think they do very much the same setup when Moriarty's coming up the stairs and he's playing Bach and that's all sort of kind of the woman in green. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's all sort of like um, as is. And it's kind of um, I think it's it's important to the story in in Scandal because for the first time you see music's associated incredibly strongly with emotion and with with expressing expressing feelings. And so I think it's really, I think it's great that the first time you really see uh, Holmes concertedly playing the violin is um, when he's looking out the window and he's thinking of Irene Adler. And I think that, that actually sort of means something rather than it just being a kind of a, a slightly um, uh, gimmicky kind of like, oh yeah, Anne can play the violin sort of thing. So, so that theme, Irene, uh, Irene's theme or the woman theme, um, that you can hear on the start of the it's sort of isolated on the start of the soundtrack album for um, season two. 
um, is then woven into the Sherlock to queue when they find out um, when they get the, the um, code right, and then also quoted again as he's looking out the window and sort of thinking about the mock execution, or is he not quite sure. Um, so, so yeah, we're sort of, um, it's interesting, we've already started thinking about what we're going to do for season three, and um, it's sort of, a, again, you sort of, you start thinking of, of things that you haven't done before and things that you, you want to do to try and sort of move things on, um, and some, some of them will stick and some of them will fall by the wayside when we actually start to see the episodes come through, and, and it could be... God knows, Bra brass bands. <laughs> so I like a brass band. <laughs> Could you whistle something for us that you're thinking of? You see these things? No. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Yeah. <laughs> Next, uh, you went up first. Yes. Hi. Um, in terms of the music, I was just wondering, when you reach a final piece, do you look back and find that the character in the scene has had more influence, or the actions that were happening, or are they synonymous? Very good question. <laughs> it's like a, this is a super bright crowd, isn't it? <laughs> I'll get away with you um, It's on a really good day, and there are... The, for any of you that, that do creative things, yourself that, that write or paint or um, you know write music or all these kind of things and if you if you either do it for a living or if you're trying to do it for a living you'll very much know the feeling of, of Joe's the same that you know you, it's kind of doing something creative for a living isn't about those wonderful moments of inspiration and sort of wandering around on, on drafty hills with your coat <laughs> blown behind you <laughs> it's about religiously sticking your ass in the chair at whatever time you start and not leaving the chair until you've finished. Um, and so the, the, a, a lot of the writing of the music for, um, for a show like Sherlock is concerted, focused work. And when you do, when you do then sort of commit yourself to doing that, this sort of slightly strange thing happens, some people call it flow, some people call it all kinds of mystical things, but basically means you just kind of get into it, and it starts to happen sort of by, slightly by itself. Um, and then when you stop at the end of the day and look, and look back at it, then it can be any of those things that you mentioned, the music can be sort of influenced by, technically by the action, so if it's, if it's a car chase, then you, you know, you, you, you Sort of breaking things down so that it moves around in the right way. If it's the end scene in Reich and Back when they're talking, when Sherlock's talking from the top of the building to, uh, to Watson. And... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <You're talking. laughs> then you know, you know that there's sort of, uh, you know, you're kind of emotionally connecting uh, with the situation and, and trying to express that. But o often that's only evident in hindsight because. Um, you, you just really need to sort of apply bomb to chair and stay there, really. <laughs> that's the same for all writers. Joe, that must be the same for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wait, what is the hat? Because you've been waiting patiently. Yes. Yes, you. Oh, gosh. Um, oh, gosh. <laughs> Hello. Um, Hello. Hello. <laughs> I've got a question for Joe. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, as we all know, you, there's John's blog, and there's bits of Molly's blog, and there's about three sentences in Charlotte's blog. <laughs> there's a lot more than that. <laughs> <laughs> that was the hardest bit. It's lovely, by the way. Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering, are there any of the other characters in the show, like, I don't know, Mycroft or Lestrade, that you were ever thinking, hey, these guys could do with a blog? Have you ever thought about <laughs> I mean, it is... It's, it's a horror. It's, it's a bit like what Michael was saying about when you do so straight for a living. Um, I'd love to write blogs for all those characters. Uh, I love Anderson. I think Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> um, but unfortunately, there isn't the money to pay me to do all those. Uh, I don't have the time to do all of them. Um, so we did. I did create 
uh, Connie Prince's <laughs> website for Series 1, which was just so I could have a laugh, really, because it's a bit, bit silly in camp. Um, but they also, yeah, a decision was made for Series 2 that we wanted to focus people more onto John's uh, site, uh, because Sherlock's site's quite tricky. I find it tricky to work my way around Sherlock's site. Um, so I sort of go, oh, there's a thing there. Did I write that? Um, but Sherlock's blog's very hard. Sherlock's stuff is very hard to do, because you've got to try and be inside his head. And, and when Stephen writes a throwaway line about a million types of coffee beans or tobacco or something, <laughs> you know, I sort of have to go back to them and go, should we have that as a, a link removed? <laughs> I'm saying there's something very clever there, but we've had to take it off because of a police investigation. Good plan, we'll no. do that. <laughs> um, and I find, my, you know, I find that you end up doing that a lot more with, with Sherlock stuff, because technically his website should be absolutely inundated with people asking him questions and him giving answers. Um, Whereas actually on John's blog, you get to have a lot more fun with the characters and with the characters I've created um, that comment on his, on his blog. Mm -hmm. um, you can have a lot more fun and do a lot more character stuff. Um, I, yeah, if, if, if there was the money and the time, I would, I would happily write for, for all of them, really. Yeah. Let's go to the back. I can't see. There, I see a hand. You, yes, you, you. <laughs> Oh, both the two points, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, my friend here and I and our friends um, were hoping to uh, produce by next summer a Sherlock musical. Ooh. <laughs> and we, it's a question for Michael, by the way. Um, is there any sort of copyright we should know about? <laughs> <laughs> Shall I get my lawyer to call you? Um, That's an interesting question, actually. <laughs> well, if, if, if you were uh, the makers of Elementary, then I think you'd be right. <laughs> 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 Yeah, quite funny. I was in, um, in the States uh, for the Emmys for Sherlock um, a couple of months ago, and the guy who writes the music for Elementary came up to me and went, I just want you to know I haven't seen your show. <laughs> yeah, really, really <laughs> not. <laughs> Uh, well, Very impartial. <laughs> yeah, so, Sherlock, um, well, all the Sherlock stories are out of copyright, the characters are out of copyright. Um, if, if you used any of uh, Mind of David's music, then I'm sure we could come to arrangement on that. Um, no, I, I, I mean, the, the characters are out of copyright, so I can't see there's any problem, really. Go for it. Woo! <laughs> Right, and this is going to be the last question. You pick, I can't see. Someone in the back. There's those girls going like this. <laughs> can we get her a microphone? Raise your hand again so we can see you. Thanks. Um, hi, this is a music question, and it's how do you actually start composing? Like, do you have a chord or like a key to start with, or would you just sit down and do it? <laughs> <laughs> the music, I mean. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, um, you, you, you definitely have to start with, you have to start with something, you have to break your duck, I don't know if Joe's the same, but you have to, you, you, there's sort of a, a blank piece of paper as it used to be, but a computer screen as it is now, um, is, a, is a terrifying thing, so you sort of have to trick yourself into starting, um, and so uh, anybody who's seen any of the sort of um, piano playing -y things that I occasionally do on the internet, um, will know that uh, one, of, one of the things that if you're trying to be a composer uh, for, for film and TV really helps is if you can improvise. So basically if you can just sort of sit down and start start playing, it's a really, really good skill to try and try and work on if you're, if you're studying music. 
because then you can sort of have a bit of a bash, basically. So just kind of play along. And once you've started to play along, it's very obvious what you're doing wrong to yourself. So then it's more of a process of sort of like going from 100% wrong to 80% wrong to <laughs> trying to get to like maybe 30% <laughs> then <handy> in, really. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it's just about breaking breaking your duck really. Don't know if Joe you feel the same about the blank page. Yes. <laughs> right, well thank you so much to Michael and Joe for <laughs>